recording this to the cloud. This is week 10, part one. It's a very horrible start to week 10, part one. <laughs> this, this is a lesson learned. If you put a time down for people to come, make sure that you put the right time down that people are going to come. So Dr. Kaz will be here at 7.30 Eastern time or a little bit before that. So if you come back in 20 minutes, I'm going to start lecturing to my class now just briefly to at least say I did a little bit. Um, okay. Does that sound good, Christian? Christian is my assistant in this class, and he'll take over if I drop off and commit Harry Carey um, for telling everyone the wrong times. <laughs> but who's on first? <laughs> who's what? Who, who's on first? I don't know who's on first. <laughs> What's on second? <laughs> oh, yeah, don't confuse me anymore, Christian. <laughs> Tonight's full of confusion. So, okay, so we had Vygotsky last week, and he was more focused on learning proceeding development. Now we move on to Piaget, where development hopefully precedes learning and we're going to include a little bit so in you're going to get a 15 minute overview of piaget how's that this is like a cliff notes on piaget there's piaget <laughs> he lived to be a heck of a lot longer than vygotsky both born in 1896 piaget died in um the 1980s i believe i'm not sure the exact date christian can look that up but he was a swiss psychologist who first was working at the Binet Institute forming intelligence tests. But actually before that, he was interested in biology and philosophy and as a writer and also all sorts of psychologists back in the day, like Skinner and, and um, Vygotsky and Piaget were all multi-talented people. They're studying many things and that what, what kind of made them intriguing in some ways and developing new ways to think about human learning and human growth. And so, Piaget set his marks in looking at the origins of intelligence and study by studying his children. Uh, and so it was kind of an interesting viewpoint concerned with mostly with a child development as opposed to adult development. So he's you know, unlike Mazarro and Malcolm Knowles who look at adult development, Piaget was looking at child development. And you know he was in addressing all aspects of human learning but he was pretty much focused on, you know, birth to age 15, 16 years old. And there's some people who put forth a theory that there's post-formal operations, post-formal development, the fifth stage of development. But Piaget focused on the first four, which I'll get to. He proposed that we have discrete stages that we operate in and we move through these stages. There are active agents in our, in our environment, but we have these, these stages of development that differentiate Fun human functioning and what we can do. For instance, young children that are pictured there can't do abstract reasoning or analogies or metaphorical thinking, um, but we teach people to be active and manipulating objects and, and through that we form new schemas. Uh, so when we first start out, we have very little specializations. We begin just with potentials as the point is made there. Through our environment, through our experiences, we grow. We grow through our through hands-on doing. So there's a lot of focus on active learning and manipulating and constructing knowledge so as to um, form new schemas that represent the world in front of us so we can negotiate, navigate the world. Uh, we have information in patterns or schemas in our brains. I'll maybe lecture on schema theory in a few weeks uh, so that you can make more better sense of schema theory and what schemas are. Uh, all children, all um, all human beings walk through us, according to Piaget, set a set number of stages. And um, we have we uh, we deal with new information by either accommodating it or assimilating it to move us back to a state of equilibrium. This equilibrium, where we don't know something, we're recognized we don't know something, forces us to do something with it. We forces us to make sense of it by in integrating it with what we already know, it's assimilating or form new schemas in our brains to account for that new information. For instance, the difference between a horse and a zebra, we might have to create a new schema to represent a zebra, which is different from a horse. We have qualitatively different stages, sensory motor first, when we're age zero to two years old, pre-operational two, uh, two to five years old, concrete operations, maybe six or seven to 11 years old. And, Formal operations after 12 or 13 years old, where we can start doing analogies and 
metaphors and um, multiple um, uh, equations in mathematics. And so we have certain processes that help us move and transition from one stage to another, such as accommodation and assimilation I mentioned earlier. And Piaget is the one who's known for that. Uh, and so as, as you read, or if you have read before in undergraduate educational psychology, maybe undergrad psych, high school psych, you have to write about how we assimilate new information based on our learnings in our environments. And so we have different information coming at us. And if it conflicts with our existing schemas, we have to make sense of that. We've, there's some dissonance in our brains, that the sense that we don't know something. And so we see a zebra instead of a horse. And now we have, we, it doesn't really quite, you know, um, integrate well with our existing knowledge. And so we have to accommodate that horse or that bear uh, playing the hula hoop or whatever he's doing there. So, you know, um, there's different kinds of um, examples that you can find for explaining assimilation and accommodation. An airplane is not a bird, therefore we have for, form a different schema to represent airplanes. Um, and a penguin is not a bird either, I believe. No, it's not. And there are, so there's a, it's a mammal, right? Penguins are mammals, Christian? Please say yes, Christian. I, I think so. And we'll move on. Yeah. Yeah. If you see yes. a three, yes, they if, are. You see a, if you see a three-legged dog, is, do you have to assimilate that or accommodate that? Well, probably you can assimilate into the, your notion of dogness or doggies, um, but you know, for a while it won't make sense to you seeing a three-legged dog out on the leash with its owner somewhere. And so you, you know, this I have all these like, um, AI and how it learns. Yeah, AI and how it learns. And so, as I said, so sensory motor stage, birth of two, pre-operational, two to seven, concrete operations, seven, 11, and, and formal operations, uh, 12 and above. Now, I have a number of videos I could show that, that explain these and, and might help you um, accommodate it better when we go through those um, in, in different stages. We move into being able to think logically we be able to make abstractions and so forth as we get older and think metacognitively, think about your thinking and so forth. And Piaget had a fun time watching his kids rep trying to represent the world um, and asking them questions uh, and um, validating his four different stages of cognitive development. Um, so we become uh, zero to two, become goal-oriented, can mentally represent objects and events, uh, three to seven or much egocentric. We think about I-ness, it's mine. Um, um, more focus on what is in front of you. At the, if, if you hide something behind a door, you might not recognize that that object still exists, especially at zero to two. Um, very narrowly focused uh, in terms of one's environment and what one looks at. Age um, eight to 11, one can reverse operations, putting a, a large beacon, Ike Tan. We have Ike Tan here. So anyone who arrived late, we, we are gonna have Dr. Cosma in 15 minutes. If you wanna come back, you can hear from Dr. Cosma. Um, so at age eight to 11, we have things that we can do, um, anal um, analyses that we can make that are different from three to seven and 12 to 15. 12 to 15, we start doing hypothesis generation. We start doing a dissertation, doing research questions and. Um, experimental designs and all that, because we can think in formal operations in effect. But uh, at a young age, young children at the pre-operational level cannot reverse operations. So if you pour a, a, a bottle of water or a, 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 fat, a fat coffee cup full of water into a taller one, um, a taller skinny one, and all the contents from here go into the other one, the younger child would say that this would have more and the older child would say, no, they're the same. They can mentally represent that. They can reverse operations back into the original container, if you will. There's a number of videos, that, as I said, that will, uh, that you, that I could have shown, but I won't have time to show them. As you can see here by the example, um, the young girl there is trying to pour into from the fat, from the tall one into the fatter one. And she believes that the fat, the tall one has more in it than the fatter one does. And the younger, the older boy 
in there understands it, or the older girl here can understand that the two are the same, the two amounts are the same here. Uh, or if you spread apart puzzle pieces or if coins, um, if you spread them apart, the younger child will say the one that's more spread apart has more coins in it than the one that's smushed together, even though they're both exactly the same at any point in time. So the law of conservation, if you will. So, um, so that's kind of an interesting thing too, conserving number over time, spatial reasoning and so forth, the three mountain task. Um, in Piaget's three mountain task, a young child has to describe the view that someone on the other side of the mountains would see. Many children, even up to the age of nine, think, this, think, that, think the view is the same, but this is par partly due to the abstract nature of the task. They can't um, imagine a different world than what they currently see or represented in front of them. Um, they can't uh, visualize the poss different possibilities in effect. In Piaget's world, as I said, constructing knowledge is critical that uh, we're all creating our own realities in effect, not just mimicking or copying a reality from someone else. Um, for Piaget, both genetics are important and nature is important. It's a dual, it's an interactive system in effect. Um, so that you know, behaviors put everything on your on nature. Uh, I'm sorry, on nurture. Piaget says no. It's both nature, genetics, and nurture uh, equally important in terms of our growth. Um, and the the environment has a huge influence on what we can do. Um, and we have another person being admitted in here again. Who's ever coming late? Dr. Cosmo will be here in ten minutes. If you want to come back, um, Dr. Cosmo will be back in ten minutes. Um, and, uh, so no, uh, from a Piagetian standpoint, all cultures, all people, all individuals, um, uh, go through the same basic stages of human development in the same order, um, sort of the same at the sort of same age levels. Now you can prompt one to, to, to push them through a little faster, but you still have to walk through the same, same stages over time. There's little or no variability in performance across domains, across cultures, and so forth from a Piagetian point of view. But he was biased in a very Western-centered tests and assessments that he was using in terms of math and science and so forth. Um, teaching can support development by using active, constructivistic kinds of um, methods so that students get into a stage of disequilibrium and a stage of dissonance that they don't know something. Um, and to try and get kids to, to do inquiry-based kinds of research, to do discovery, to do exploration, um, to uh, interact with their environment, if you will. And for, for Piaget, uh, collaborative learning with uh, homogeneous peers is more important. And Vygotsky is more heterogeneous, having more expert-like peers prompt, nudge, and provoke you to think differently is important from a Vygotskyan point of view. For Piaget's really uh, homogeneous kinds of grouping or same age grouping. Um, but um, there were some that said that Piaget hadn't totally fleshed out the social side of his theory. So the constructivist principles I've had up there before, I, I, I won't repeat all of these, but really important is having meaningful or relevant kinds of learning, having flexibility or choice in one's learning, building on what students already know, prior knowledge, manipulating raw data in, in your environment, interacting through inquiry-based forms of learning or problem-based forms of learning or discovery forms of learning, and then having dialogue, discussing what your findings were, what you've dis uh, discovered, what the research inquiry research has revealed to you. So getting students into dialogue and discussing and conversing right. about it, and then elaborating on, on their reasoning and then posing contradictions to what they have said, to moving them into disequilibrium, kind of using the Socratic approach to get people to think, well, maybe I'm not right. Maybe I've made the wrong hypothesis or the wrong, you know, maybe the discovery I made isn't universal in nature. So asking students open-ended questions and having them think and reflect and giving them time to think and reflect on their experiences. So again, we want to, my colleague Don Cunningham and I wrote an article about cognitive constructivism, social constructivism, learner-centered environments. And there are some truths or some key things about cognitive constructivism, which is 
kind of situated with Piaget, uh, these are the ones there, you know, fostering self-regulated learning, metacognition, thinking about your thinking, having students work in authentic or meaningful situations and problems and make discoveries on their own and form questions and link knowledge, new knowledge to old knowledge and get kids to interact maybe across. And I'll just skip a couple of these. Piaget was uh, one, and I've got a couple of minutes. Left. Piaget was one who studied with, um, I'm sorry, Papper was one who studied with Piaget. Um, Papper originally from South Africa, went up to Geneva and worked with um, Piaget before coming to MIT and becoming famous for expanding Piaget's ideas into the area of constructionism as opposed to constructivism. Constructionism means you're building something. You're, you're, you're building a sandcastle at a beach or you're creating a um, computer game or you're you know, uh, designing something. You're putting something out like in a maker lab. And it's through the, you know, creating computer code, designing um, programs and so forth. Having the learner take charge. So uh, Papert really believed in instruction where the learner takes a significant charge of their own learning. You let the learner do as much as they can. He felt that ineffective learning was really too much teaching. Um, and so you want kids to, to think about things and give them devices to help them think about things like in a maker lab or a computer lab or some other space, uh, a media department and so forth. Um, so he says, do away with curriculum, do away with segregation by age, do away with the idea that there should be uniformity in all schools and of what people learn. The really competitive skill is the skill to be able to learn, learn how to learn. And so he created the One Laptop Per Child Project or helped with Nicholas Necroponte at MIT, where he had kids who could computer, do computer code in that $100 laptop, which really became a $200 laptop, but nonetheless was a device that would, would get kids to work with one another. And so um, a long time ago, I went to the American Education Research Association meeting in Boston, went to his lab. I've been to MIT Computer Lab twice. I met Tapper. He gave a speech at one of those. He's a very seductive speaker. You had to shake your head no every time he talked because you were going to probably agree with everything he said. He was a very interesting guy. And he had a, a book, new book called Constructionism. It was yellow. All his grad students in his lab wrote chapters in that book. He, he co-edited with Edith Harrell, who's still around. I think she's a UPenn professor today. Um, and um, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, he got in an accident uh, two, in December 2006 when I was in Taiwan. He was in Vietnam and a motorcycle hit him and almost killed him. Uh, but he did survive uh, and lived another 10 or 12 years um, and lived in Maine, retired to Maine and so forth. I'll skip over some of these um, and get to Robert Siegler. So Robert Siegler, I met as well when my first job at West Virginia University, he, he tried to expand Piaget's ideas or at least try to understand them better because he was trying to, trying to do what was called microgenetic analysis. Um, and what's done in microgenetic analysis, so he sees kind of uh, growth as a stage of development, but, but more of a sequential acquisition of specific knowledge and strategies. Let me try and go to um, microgenetic. So microgenetic is trying to capture at a moment in time human development to try and create a snapshot of it. So they have children who you say, um, you know, uh, what's three plus two? And the kids will go, well, one, two, three, four, five. And you'll go, well, what's three? Christian, what's three plus two? Show me what's three plus two, Christian. And how'd you get to that? I had my fingers together. <laughs> okay. And so he's back in, you know, in as a six-year-old. But if he was, if Christian was got to, to seven years old, he would now, he maybe start with three as the larger and just go four, five. So the development, so instead of going one, two, three, four, five, as you develop, now you can say, oh, three, four, five. And so what, what Siegler was do, would do is give the kids the same questions over and over and over and over again till that flash of insight happened and they had new structures that could solve that particular problem. 
and he called that microgenetic analysis to capture competencies uh, uh, through observing performance over time, repeated performance over time would get at how people learn in effect, uh, multiple observations, multiple codings. Um, and my dissertation was kind of like that. We captured keystrokes when kids wrote and we had every keystroke they wrote. We could watch them develop their thought over time and make um, have them respond to prompts about creativity and critical thinking. And some internalize these over time and we could watch their development over a series of writing sessions, um, uh, you know, writing episodes or drafts of their paper over time. One, two, three. Oh, one, two, three. Got it. Okay. So there's the kid's example of Christian there on the left. He's going, you know, how, how much, you know, what, what is three plus three? Well, it's six. Well, then later he goes, oh, three, four, five, six. And soon he could just do six, right? So, you know, it's a way to un maybe understand development in process in the context in which it's ongoing, okay? Short observational time, in fact, normally entails short weeks or months, but we don't have weeks or months to, you know, as researchers out there. Anyways, I'll end with that. Um, and Dr. Cosma is here, by the way. So good. Okay, Bob's with us. So let me end part one. I'm going to stop the recording with part one, week number 10, right?